I have a couple of questions for you as we begin this morning. First one, do you believe that God will protect you? Secondly, do you believe that God will provide for you? And thirdly, do you believe that God is with you? Now, these are the things that we'll consider this morning as we look at Psalm chapter 23. So this is the third psalm that we've looked at together. It's the fourth week of our journey through the poetry of the Old Testament. And with the psalms, we began with Psalm chapter 1, which was more of a wisdom psalm, looking at the wisdom of God. Secondly, we looked at Psalm chapter 8 last week, which is a song or a hymn of praise. And this morning, we'll be focusing on Psalm 23, which is a psalm of thanksgiving, thanksgiving for and confidence in the Lord's care for us, the Lord's care for His people. And this psalm also, as Psalm 8 last week was, is a psalm of David, which says in the heading. So before we even get into the text of the psalm, I'm sure that most of us would say it's one of the most <clears throat> well-known psalms and chapters in the entire Bible. Perhaps even before we read it, you're reciting it in your own mind, thinking of the words of this psalm uh, as we prepare to look through it. But this morning, we're going to take the time to look at it in depth, uh, verse by verse. You may also have heard this psalm used in many different situations. Perhaps as a child or youth, you memorized it or heard it in messages. Possibly you heard it being used at a funeral or maybe even at a wedding. The text of this psalm it provides a great reminder that our Lord is always there for us. And it's such an encouragement to hear these words and it can spur us on even in our darkest moments as you see in the psalm even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So just thinking about this psalm, looking at it from the big picture, if you look at the first four verses of the psalm, it talks about the Lord as our shepherd or the Lord as my shepherd. And then the last two verses look at it more as the Lord as a host. Someone hosting people in their home and, and at their table. And thinking of the author, King David, he would have been very familiar with both these roles. As knowing David and his background, he was a shepherd as a boy. He took time with the sheep. He was protecting the sheep. He was traveling with the sheep, doing whatever needed to be done to look after the sheep for several years. And then secondly, talking about the Lord as host, David would have been very familiar uh, being a host, serving that role when he was the king, inviting people into his court, those that would visit. And also, you may be familiar with the story of Mephibosheth, who was the son of Jonathan and the grandson of King Saul. Uh, David invited him to come into his court, to stay with him, to eat at his table for the rest of his life, acting as a host uh, to this man. And that story really with David and Mephibosheth is a, could be a whole message in itself that we could focus on. But I just bring it up to understand that David speaking as shepherd, Lord is shepherd and Lord is host, uh, he could speak it of that from experience and it would be meaningful for the people that heard it as well. So let's get right into the text this morning. Let's read Psalm chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So looking at this psalm, as I said before, I'm sure it brings up many memories, maybe fond memories of reading through this or reading and thinking upon these words through a difficult time. Um, but as we look at the psalm as a whole, each verse also works well independently. So we'll work through it verse by verse from verse 1 to verse 6. Again, remembering that the first four verses focus on the Lord as shepherd. The second, the last two really speak of the Lord as host. So the first verse, we see, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
As I mentioned last week, and you may have noticed, the Lord in the first verse is all in capitals, which represents, as I spoke about last week, the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, representing the name Yahweh, God's name Yahweh that he gives to the people of Israel, meaning I am who I am, God's covenant name. So recognize that in the first part. But also think of the Lord uh, being spoken of as shepherd. You may be familiar, you may think of many places in the Bible where this is a common theme. Especially in the book of Psalms, this is brought up in many places. Some places include Genesis chapter 48, Genesis chapter 49, Psalm 28, Psalm 80, Psalm 95, Psalm 100, and Revelation chapter 7. These are just some of the examples where the Lord is spoken of as shepherd. So it's a, it's a common theme. Also, you can think of John chapter 10, where Jesus himself says, I am the good shepherd. And then throughout other places, throughout both the Old and New Testaments, you can see shepherd metaphors being used, where believers are spoken of as sheep, pastors are spoken of as shepherds, there's places where it's spoken of bad shepherds or bad leaders and wolves in sheep's clothing, thieves trying to steal from the flock of sheep, etc., etc., etc. It could go on. So it's throughout the Bible and it makes sense for them because there were shepherds, there was sheep. People would see the sheep in the fields, the shepherds working. Probably some of the people in the church had experience as shepherds. So it makes sense. But for us today, is this an effective picture or analogy or metaphor? And if it is, why is it so effective and, and why was it so common in the Bible? So first, we'll think about why we would speak of believers as sheep. From a website, uh, talks about what does it mean that the Lord is my shepherd. Talking about sheep, it says, Sheep have a tendency to wander and get lost. They are basically helpless creatures who cannot survive long without a shepherd, upon whose care they are totally dependent. And likewise, like sheep, we are totally dependent upon the Lord to shepherd, to protect, and to care for us. And secondly, from the Tyndale Old Testament commentary on this chapter, it says, In the word shepherd, David uses the most comprehensive and intimate metaphor yet encountered in the Psalms, preferring usually the more distant king or deliverer or the impersonal title rock, shield, Whereas the shepherd lives with his flock and is everything to his flock, guide, protector, and physician, caring for them, living life with them, protecting them. And it, as thinking of the words here, it reminds of uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, another well-known uh, chapter where it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Of course, pro prophesying about Jesus who was to come. So again, as I said, using the metaphor of the sheep and a shepherd was something meaningful for the audience. Something that they would understand as they would see the shepherds, the sheep, the flocks of sheep. It would be meaningful for them. So yes, it was effective for the people of that time. But as we look back, as we understand the culture, as we understand the context of what a shepherd's role was... It helps us also to understand what is being said here, that we would learn more about God and understand more of who He is and His character. So the question for us is, are we like sheep? As it said in some of those quotes, in many ways the answer would be yes, that we are totally dependent on God. But in many cases, also no. We talked about a sheep being a helpless creature, totally dependent upon the shepherd. And we, we've talked about this before. I think there are times that we are in that place of being helpless, being totally dependent upon God. When we're in the desperate low place, when life has beat us down, maybe we've experienced a loss, maybe we're going through a difficult time, it feels like everything is falling apart. Then we come to Jesus. We totally rely fully on Him as a lost sheep follows the shepherd when it's found. But on the average day, are we living like a sheep? Are we looking to and following the Lord as our shepherd on the average day by day as we live our life? I know for myself, and I could predict that for many of us, the answer would be not enough. Certainly not all the time that we're looking to Him, relying on Him day by day, moment by moment. So that's the, considering the first part of the verse, the Lord is our shepherd. 
So the verse continues on. I shall not want. Again, we think in the context of the shepherd and the sheep, that the sheep are relying fully on the shepherd to lead them, to provide for them, even with their most basic needs. We may be grateful to the Lord for what we receive, what He gives us, but do we thank Him? Do we rely on Him for everything we receive? Think of what we have even today, just another day to live, breath in our lungs, food to eat, a roof over our heads, a place to gather here and worship Him. He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider, giving us everything that we need day by day, moment by moment. And you may be familiar with the name Jehovah Jireh, but this name comes from Genesis chapter 22, the story of Abraham being told to take Isaac up on the mountain as a sacrifice. But just as he was about to sacrifice his only son that God asked him to lay on the altar, he provides the ram to make as a sacrifice in the place of his son. So Abraham calls this place Jehovah Jireh or Yahweh Yireh. The Lord will provide. The Lord our provider. So do we believe this? Do we believe that the God is our provider? And do we not only believe this, but do we live as if He is our provider, that He will provide? I will admit myself, I certainly struggle with this. To believe this and to live as if it were true. Things pile up. Bills are due. My first instinct many times is to be stressed out and think about what I can do to get what I need, what I need to get done. But my, my first instinct should be to pray, but many times it's not my first instinct. We should ask God to provide trust that He will provide. But as we hear here in this verse, we shall not want. He is our provider and He will give everything that we need. I mean, think of the story of Abraham and his son Isaac, this desperate situation he was in. When he made this statement, talking about Jehovah, Jireh, the Lord our provider, he was going up on a mountain to give a sacrifice, to sacrifice his only son, his promised son that he had waited years and years for from God. Yet he was ready to lay this promised, this cherished son on the altar and sacrifice him to the Lord. Abraham trusted God, even in the most difficult circumstance, and God provided. Maybe you find yourself in a desperate situation this morning. Or maybe, if not this morning, maybe you will in the coming days. Find yourself in a place where you don't know how you're going to make it through. What can you do in that time? What will you do? Hopefully, as I said, our first place would be to turn to the Lord in prayer. Trusting that He can help us. That He will help us. That He will provide for us. And that He can help us out of even the most difficult, even the most desperate circumstance. So then flipping down, looking to verse 2, we hear, it says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. So this verse is continuing on that we shall not want for the Lord will take us where we need to go. The green pastures, the still waters, thinking of sheep, it's the places where sheep can get their food, where they can drink, and where they can rest. Even though at times, as I said, we may be in a difficult place, we may be in a desperate situation, even in those times, God will still lead us where we need to go. We need to simply trust Him. We will find ourselves in the place where we can get the rest that we need, where we can get what we need to survive, to be refreshed, to be fulfilled, and to receive all that is needed. God will provide. So flip down again, verse 3. He restores my soul, and He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. As we spoke of rest, as we think about coming to a place of rest in verse 2, having the chance to receive that from God, now in verse 3 we hear that the Lord will restore our soul. And what a blessing it is to hear that, to think that He will restore our soul. He will give us all that we need. I know to me that sounds so satisfying to have our soul be restored. Perhaps over the last couple of years of uncertainty and turmoil and all the things that we've endured, it feels like your soul has been in turmoil as well. So to hear from the Lord that He will restore our soul, bring us back to fullness, it sounds like such an amazing promise if we will let Him restore us. And so it continues on. Again, 
He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He leads us for His name's sake, not for our name's sake. As we come to the Lord, as we rely on Him, as we seek Him and the direction that He has for us, hopefully it would be out of our love and gratitude towards Him for all that He has done for us that we would not be seeking these things for self-righteousness, that we would not be seeking it to look good, that we would not be doing these things to earn God's favor or any goodwill from Him, but for His sake, that we would follow Him, that we would look to Him for His sake, for His name's sake, as it says here. As I mentioned last week, as followers of Christ, we bear His name. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, it says that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are His representatives on the earth. So as we seek the Lord, as we seek His path and His direction of righteousness, His name would be glorified. That people would see us living like Christ, that people would see us following Him. May they seek Him themselves. As they see us love, as they see us show God's love, maybe they see God through us, may they see His love flowing in us and out through us. Now we look at verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Looking at the first part, walk through the valley of the shadow of death, another translation could be the valley of deep darkness. And there's something about darkness that can instill fear in us. I know for me, it always has been that way, especially when I was younger. There's something about the darkness, not knowing what is out in the deep darkness of nightfall. Thinking your mind goes to the worst things that could possibly be out there that you can't see what's out there. And in this context here, thinking of the context that they were in, in the wilderness, in the valleys, uh, in the deserts of Judah, there could be bandits, there could be wild animals lurking in the shadows. So walking through the valley could be a dangerous place to go. They could be waiting to pounce upon a vulnerable person, a person who is not expecting to be jumped in upon. It could be definitely a scary situation to be out in the wilderness, in the desert, in the darkness. And continuing again with the shepherd and the sheep analogy, think of a flock of sheep wandering through the wilderness. If they were by themselves, wild animals would be ready to pounce upon them and tear them to shreds. Yet, as they have the shepherd with them, the shepherd protects them, the shepherd will keep them safe, and there is no need for them to fear. You may be familiar with the stories of David when he was a shepherd. It talks about how the Lord helped him protect his flock from all kinds of wild animals that tried to jump upon the sheep. So in the same way, we need not fear even as we're in the darkness, as we're in the difficult place, for what is there to fear? The Lord is with us, protecting us, guiding us, comforting us, even in the darkest, even in the most difficult of times. I think back again to times in my life when I was feeling fearful, when I was struggling with fear, when I was looking into the darkness and not sure what was out there. I prayed to the Lord. I prayed that He would protect me and help me not to fear, even in those most difficult moments. I prayed to Him because I didn't know what else to do to get rid of the fear that I was feeling. It makes me think of the words in Psalm chapter 56, verses 3 and 4. I'm just going to flip there. Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. It says there, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? So when we are afraid, we can trust in God. For what can flesh or man, what need is there to fear from flesh or man, what can they do to us? Trust in God, for He will protect us, He will be with us. But maybe we do have fears today. Maybe we have fears of not being able to provide for our family, fear of losing someone that's close to us, or maybe it's fear of dying ourselves. This is one of the most common fears that many people will face, of dying. And it's, yeah, one of the most common fears around but we can turn these things over to God in the face of darkness, in the face of fear, in the valley of the shadow of death, we have nothing to fear. Hope in God. 
But why shall we not fear? That is the question. So thinking upon that, we continue on. Verses 5 and 6. For you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So again, as I mentioned before, we do see a slight shift here from the Lord as shepherd to the Lord who is hosting us at a table. But we continue to hear the Lord's care and His provision for us. And may we be filled with thankfulness for the care that He has for us. That even in the presence of our enemies, it doesn't say that the enemies are removed, but even in the presence of our enemies, God cares for us. He anoints our heads with oil. He fills our cup to overflowing, blessing us beyond belief, giving us more than we could ever hope to deserve. And then it says that God's goodness and His mercy will follow us all the days of our life. God is good. God is merciful. And as He is with us, as it says here, His goodness and His mercy will be with us forever. We will receive those blessings forever all the days of our life. And then as it concludes, it says, And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What more can we desire? What a beautiful way it is to sum up this psalm, this psalm of confidence, this psalm of gratitude for what God has for us, the care that He has for us. We can have full confidence in our Lord, ultimately, as it says here, that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For no matter what happens to us on the earth, as it says in Romans chapter 10, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. So, the first part, if we confess, if we make a declaration that Jesus is the Lord of our life, and then secondly, if we believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, as it says here, we will be saved. And what an amazing promise that it is, this is that we can hold on to, that we would be saved from the punishment that we deserve, the death that we deserve, and we will dwell with the Lord in His house forever, as it says here in Psalm 23. Praise God for that truth. What a wonderful truth that is that we can hold on to this morning. So the question is for us this morning as we leave this text. Will we seek the Lord as our shepherd? Will we seek Him? Will we follow His voice? Will we follow His path? Will we follow His purpose for our lives? And may we follow Him. May we seek Him that we may one day dwell in His house forever. And what a blessed life that will be to live. Let's pray together. Lord God, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon us. Just what an amazing God you are, your love, your mercy, your grace. And we thank you so much for your word that we can look at this morning and each and every day. Lord God, you are so good, more good than we can ever deserve. Lord, you give us abundantly more than we could ever ask or desire. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.